Sarah McEnany and Liz Collins uh, focused on papermaking. These artists worked with our collaborative papermaker and faculty, Nicole Donnelly, and who is here today. And today, Nicole invited two artists and papermakers, May Babcock and Tatiana Ginsberg, uh, who, like her, are contributing innovative perspectives in papermaking, a discipline that PAFA offers also to its students. Uh, I will share with you brief bios before giving the floor to Nicole, who will be followed by Tatiana Ginsberg and then May Babcock. The talks will go until 7.30, at which point there will be a Q&A session. I hope you can stay with us until then, because Nicole, May and Tatiana have a lot to share with us. Nicole uh, is joining us from Philadelphia, is a visual artist and hand paper maker. She teaches paper making as a traditional craft and artistic medium in two and three dimensions at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia and the PAFA, where she's also the collaborative paper maker for the Broski Center. She owns and operates the creative studio Paper Think Tank where her personal artwork focuses on the use of invasive plants in paper sculptures and environmental installations. Her work has been shown and collected locally, nationally, and internationally. She's a co-developer of the Hand Paper Makers Archive and Database Project, and her writing has been published in Hand Paper Making, the magazine, and Paper Makers Tears, um, that come out, came out as volume one, and now um, there is a forthcoming volume two. Serving as president of the International Association of Hand Paper Makers and Paper Artists from 2015 to 2022, she has met and befriended paper makers and paper artists across the world with the mission of making handmade paper a recognized art medium and valued sustainable craft. From New York, we have Tatiana Ginsberg, who makes drawings, prints, books, and other things, most of which use her own handmade paper. She studied at the University of Iowa Center for the book and received her MFA at, from UC Santa Barbara. In between, she spent two years in Japan researching naturally dyed papers under a Fulbright a grant, Study and studying at one of the oldest dye studios in Kyoto, she learned the art of dyeing paper in brilliant colors for temple festivals, sutra copying, copying, and other uses. Together with Doi Yuko, she translated Wasi Sokan, Wasi, the soul of Japan, fine Japanese paper in the second millennium, a 12 volume compendium of paper samples and essays. For the Legacy Press, she edits the series Paper Makers Tears, essays and on the art and craft of paper. And as director of artistic projects and master collaborator at Dieudonné Paper Mill in New York City, she works with other artists to make new work in handmade paper, her own work combines traditionally, traditional and contemporary methods of paper making. May Babcock joins us from Rhode Island. She's based in Pochek. Oh my God, I'm just, I'm just not pronouncing it correctly. Rhode Island, you, you will correct me. Uh, whose work is rooted in hand paper making and place and encompasses craft, book, arts, ecology, gardening, community building, sculpture and installation, printmaking, and analog photography. She holds a BFA in painting and printmaking from the University of Connecticut and an MFA from Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge. She is also a University of Rhode Island master gardener and a certified invasive plant manager. She has exhibited her work widely and has been in residence at national parks, national forests, universities, and wilderness areas. She has taught paper making at Rhode Island School of Design and the School of Museum of Fine Arts at Tufts University. She's a natural, national arts strategies creative community fellow 
and was awarded a Citizen Citation Award for Environmental Education from the Mayor of Providence, Rhode Island. She is the founder of the blog paperslurry.com. In 2019, she prototyped a creative placemaking project, Potichek Paper Center, a community papermaking studio, which I understand is now closed, if I'm correct. Um, but the link it was in the chat that I sent you to learn more about it. She currently serves on the board of director for Hand Paper Making, the magazine. And now, um, Nicole Donnelly, please take it away for to begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. And thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. It really is so wonderful to see so many faces. Um, I am going to be talking about how paper influences the creative process of paper making. And because our audience, um, some of you are very familiar with paper making, I know, and perhaps some of you are not so familiar, we are going to get a quick background in paper making. Um, and we're going to start with the very basics. What is paper? Uh, paper is made from cellulose, which means it is made from plants. And typically humans have used fast fiber from perennial plants, which are macerated, dispersed in water, then reformed on a screen. And when I speak about hand paper making, I really am talking about making paper by hand, start to finish, beginning with the raw materials. And we like to harvest the plants, we wet the fiber, beat the fiber, disperse that fiber in a vat of water, form the sheet of paper, which you can see over on the right. And by the way, thank you, Mae Babcock, for providing this wonderful gif. Next, we cooch the sheet of paper onto another surface. Each of those is laid one on top of another to create a post. That post of paper is pressed to remove some of the water, and then the sheets of paper are dried. But water is an essential part of every step of making paper. And making paper is a craft that is over 2,000 years old. And in those 2,000 years, actually very little has changed in the process of making paper. Um, so if you're not familiar, paper was invented in China, and it's attributed to the eunuch Tsai Lun. However, the oldest sheet of paper that we have actually dates to about 250 BCE, about um, 300 years before Ceylon invented paper, quote unquote. Uh, what actually happened is Ceylon was uniquely positioned in the court of the Han Dynasty, at the time the world's largest empire, the world's largest government. And what do governments like? Paperwork. And Ceylon did not discover paper, but he introduced it to the court of the Han Dynasty and perfected a recipe that made paper inexpensive, lightweight, flexible, easy to transport. This substrate was the first time that we had things that were not expensive, fragile, brittle, liable to be broken, destroyed. And the previous writing substrates were things like clay tablets, wood, bamboo, uh, pieces of cloth. Writing on silk was very expensive, animal skins. Um, so this was a very important, very valuable invention. And one that the Chinese recognized as very valuable because as you can see from this map, they guarded that secret for about 800 years. So the Buddhists began transporting their sutras written on paper. And the Buddhists were great missionaries. So they traveled into Korea and Japan, taking paper further, west, further east. And in this area of Southeast Asia, the paper mulberry grows rapidly. Paper also traveled along the Silk Road, along the trade routes. So it was a deeply, uh, it was a deeply guarded secret of how it was made, but paper as a physical artifact traveled widely. And as paper traveled along the Silk Road and further into the reaches of Central Asia, it changes the plants that it's using again. So the Daphne grows in the mountainous regions of Central Asia, 
In 750 at the Battle of Talas, two Chinese papermakers are captured and they are forced to disclose the secrets of how paper is made and thus papermaking travels further west. And as it travels further west into the Middle East, into these very arid regions, again, the plants of papermaking change. So cotton and hemp are used um, as well as some of their rag alternatives. And papermaking travels through the Middle East into Northern Africa. When it arrives in Cairo about the year 900, it collapses the papyrus economy. Papyrus is not, quote, true paper. And we can have a separate, separate discussion about that. Um, but it was, paper was so significant that it crashed the entire economy of Egypt. Paper continues to travel through Northern Africa which is held by the Islamic world up into Spain, also part of the Islamic world. And in the year 1000, most of Europe is Christian. However, Spain is occupied by the Muslims and we are in the middle of the crusades. So Europe, despite knowing how valuable paper is, they don't want to buy it from the Islamic world. What they do, the Italians invent the watermark in order to distinguish their paper from the Islamic paper and thus making it safe to consume. So paper making continues to spread throughout Europe. It is made primarily from the flax plant. Um, however, in this Northern climate, flax has much greater use as a garment, as clothing before it has use as paper. Uh, and so paper is made from rags, from worn out clothing and the term rag paper comes into existence. So as paper travels through Europe, uh, by about the mid 1400s, the Europeans believe that they have invented paper. And this begins to sound like a story that's rather familiar. Uh, so over on the very far left here, you can see an arrow pointing to Pennsylvania. In 1690, paper making traveled with William Rittenhouse to just outside of Philadelphia in Germantown. He brought with him knowledge of how paper was made in the Netherlands. And while paper was very valuable also in the colonies of the United States, the US, um, the colonies were printing tons of pamphlets to overthrow British rule. Um, however, oh, there's our picture of flax and linen rag. Um, however, hand paper making in the United States was very short lived. The Industrial Revolution produ produces the Fordrinier machine, otherwise known as the endless paper machine. So the last hand paper making mill in the US closes in 1866 and it hand paper making is not revived until 1912 by Dard Hunter. And we could give an entire lecture on him and then some, but that will be saved for another day. Um, here you can see this schematic drawing for the paper machine. And this is maybe a little bit of what you're more familiar with seeing when it comes to a paper factory or a paper mill. Uh, but this machine really just allowed paper pulp and water to fill at one end. And that pulpy water was sprayed onto a conveyor belt that went through these cylinders, producing a roll of paper that is dry at the end. A truly marvelous invention, it sped up the production of paper greatly, which was needed because the process of printing was also sped up greatly by the Industrial Revolution. However, at each step of increasing production, we put greater stress on the natural resources that are used in paper making, which are plants and water. So by the time we are getting into our current practices, of paper making and paper making really is an, indust an industry. By we are looking at wood rather than perennial plants. And wood is very hard. And this is when paper making becomes a deeply polluting industry for uh, nearly everywhere in the world. Um, these, <laughs> you know, uh, wood requires a lot of chemicals to break down, and paper mills were very often po powered by water because they needed water, they stationed themselves next to water, and any kind of waste was simply flushed out back into the rivers, making it a really unhealthy ecosystem. 
So today in the best case scenario, we are harvesting wood pulp from sustainably managed forests and subtropical forests are actually more sustainable just because they are a more resilient ecosystem than some of the temperate forests. Um, but the process of converting wood into paper pulp is very intensive mechanically, chemically, um, at all steps. So the logs have to be sewn down, they go through a deep barking drum, the wood is cut into wood chips. And as we all know, if you put wood chips into water, they are not going to form anything like paper. So those wood chips have to be further processed between rotating discs, they're washed and heated. In order to be cleaned, they're washed and screened. They go through a bleaching process. They're stored until they're ready to be used. And then as you can see in this middle diagram here, which is very simplified, um, the paper making fibers are mixed with chemicals and fillers and a lot of water to form a stock that is only 1% wood pulp fiber. And then this is sprayed in a thin band into um, these paper making mold surfaces at 2000 liters per second at a speed of 100 kilometers an hour. Really, it's truly outstanding that you can generate a ton of paper in 20 minutes. But from forest to paper, an average of 1,045 liters of water is used per kilo of paper produced. That means that your average ream of copy paper uses 544 gallons of water from the forest to the store. It's pretty outstanding. Keeping in mind, a lot of improvements have been made and some of our lesser water intensive industry paper producers are using as little as um, half a gallon of water per sheet and sometimes less. Um, but this is a short presentation. So we're moving on into the water consumption of hand paper making, which what a relief, it's so much less. So hand paper making, we are using sustainable plants, um, plants that grow back every year. The paper mulberry of Eastern paper making thrives in damp climates of Southeast Asia and also the East Coast of the United States. It is an aggressive grower in its native environment and it's invasive here in the US. Those plants after they're harvested are steamed to remove the bast fiber and the outer bark. The outer bark is scraped off of the fiber and then the fiber is cooked in water with an alkali and then rinsed very well. This is probably the most intensive process of water usage in Eastern paper making. The hand beating that's required to turn that fiber into pulp is only one part water to two parts fiber. And sheets of paper are formed in a vat of water using anywhere from 10 gallons for a small mold and up to 30 gallons or more for larger sizes. And this vat water is conserved and reused. Um, and again, Eastern paper making is probably one of the more conservative uses of water in hand paper making that there is, only surpassed by Indo-Islamic paper making, which is where paper was made in arid regions and truly water must be conserved. Um, so over here on the right, you can see what that Eastern mold and deckle looks like. It's a flexible bamboo mold surface. Sheets of paper are rolled out one at a time onto this felt and they are stacked in a post, one sheet right on top of the other, wet paper right on top of wet paper, separated only by a thread to help pull them apart after they've been pressed. Um, we're going to look at the water consumption of Western paper making, which uses a little more water. Uh, flax thrives in cool climates and with moderate rainfall, but it really requires very little effort of cultivation. So it can fill a field all by itself. Traditionally, these fibers were dew redded. So taking the stalks down, lying them in the field and letting them sit there for a couple of weeks between the water and microbial action, uh, that would break down the fibers, remove the non-cellulose material, and you're able to separate the bast fiber from the woody core, which is then discarded. The flax fiber can be used raw for paper making, or it can be spun into a textile and then used in the rag form. Um, 
Used in the rag form, textile production uses a lot of water as well. Uh, and a quick comparison here, a linen shirt uses 6.4 liters of water compared to the 2,700 liters for a cotton shirt. So cotton is also a popular papermaking fiber. Um, it, if we're going from textile to paper, then certainly we're using a lot more water in the process. Um, but the beading of Western fibers typically uses much more water than Eastern beading. And uh, this is a Hollander beater over here on the left by David Reyna. We have the same machine at the Brodsky Center in Philadelphia. And it uses 65 parts water to one part fiber, but that same water can be used in the vat to make the sheets of paper. And the vat, again, is filled with water anywhere from five gallons to as much as 30 or more, depending on the size of your mold. But that water is conserved and reused as much as possible. Down here on the lower right, we have the Western mold, which is a rigid mold surface, typically woven wire or um, yep, a, a woven wire to show a wove surface or laid wires. And now, thankfully, we are getting into the creative techniques, which are also entirely water-based and everything that we do in paper making that involves uh, these creative techniques really mostly is done while the paper is wet. Um, here we are looking at a piece of paper by Douglas Howell using embedding at, or inclusions, it's sometimes called, but a, a sheet of paper is formed and it's laid onto a surface. Then uh, he laid down a piece of textile directly on top of that sheet, pulled another sheet of paper cooched it directly on top. And after that paper is pressed, the water is removed and the paper is dried. These two sheets of paper are fused together as one, never to be separated again. And that is sort of where the magic of paper making lies. So there are many things that we can embed in paper. These are just a couple short examples, um, but we can use opaque pulps or translucent pulps to either hide and simply re reveal texture or to completely reveal what is embedded between those sheets. Uh, another creative technique that we use in paper making is pulp painting. And this is when we use a finely beaten pulp over here on the left. We add pigment and a retention agent to adhere that pigment to the pulp. And you pull a base sheet that is either white or tan or some sort of neutral layer generally, and then apply these colored pulps over the surface, much as you would a typical traditional paint. Um, here in the center, you can see how soupy and wet that, that paper pulp is, that pulp painting. And over on the far right, we have the dry version of that pulp, of that pulp painting as well. Um, and that is really where I fell in love with uh, paper making was that imagery could be introduced into the paper and become one with the substrate. The two things cannot be separated again. Um, this is a piece that I made last year called Dreaming of Elsewhere and it's handmade flax paper with linen pulp paint. And you can see in the kind of marbled details in that atmospheric landscape that the pulp paints are really swirling together and they've been encouraged to swirl together to create this sort of dreamy uh, sky sea landscape. Um, and because this one was included in the advertisement for tonight's talk, here is Carved in Water, which employs both of the creative techniques that I've outlined um, over on the top right. We have uh, native and invasive plant materials that were embedded between sheets of paper. Uh, on, also on the top, we have large pulp paintings. These are four feet by five feet each. And uh, they depict the FDR Park, which is in South Philadelphia. Uh, the change in its topography and geography over the course of 250 years. So this project was really made in response to the anticipated impacts of climate change and rising sea level. South Philadelphia, in particular FDR Park, um, were historically estuary and much of it is below sea level. So it's going to be very directly impacted as sea level rises. And the title Carved in Water really does refer to the city of Philadelphia because it was a city of canals before we paved over those canals and turned them into sewers. Um, it refers to the process of papermaking. 
and more specifically to the process of pulp painting, because you can see how water will carve through those pulp paints. And finally, water to carve something in water is an impermanent act, and this was a temporary site-specific installation. So that's enough about my work, and I'm going to talk about the work at the Brodsky Center. Um, I had the opportunity to work with Sarah McEnany in 2020 and 2021. And at the Brodsky Center, we're typically working with artists who have not worked in this medium before. So Sarah is a painter and sometimes a sculptor. She uh, really focuses on daily life and the scenes from her daily life and her pets feature heavily in that. So it was not a surprise when she wanted to sculpt her dog, Mango, uh, to make a life-size sculpture and recreate that in paper. So we made a five piece rubber mold for Mango and the dog is life-size. So it's about 21 inches high, 26 inches wide and uh, very three-dimensional. So as I mentioned before, pulp painting, I formed sheets of paper that were deeply pigmented this yellow orange and Sarah worked with all the colors of the mango fruit to make 50 paintings for our edition. Um, two paintings were used per dog and uh, each dog took about three days to dry. And you can see me on the right here laying in wet sheets of paper. And it was very important that the entire process happen while it was wet because of course, after paper dries, it is very inflexible. And for a sculpture, this paper is actually 500 GSM. It's quite thick and heavy. So to keep those papers wet, we kept them wrapped in plastic. It took three days for each dog to dry. So rather than having Sarah come back, make two paintings, come back again in another week, make two paintings. I just kept this stack of papers there, laid them into the dog one at a time, working through the addition. And here is the finished mango mango. Um, a very intensive process and a lot of fun. The second artist I worked with in 2020, 2021 is Liz Collins, a Brooklyn based designer and textile designer. Um, really interesting artist, great color palette and just fun designs to work with. She came in with an idea from 2014. It was a drawing that she'd worked on, but it had started to fall, in a, started to fall apart. It was tape and yarn. Of course, the tape fell off of the paper that was holding it together. So we decided to recreate this in paper because yarn sandwiched between paper pulp would stay forever. So we're using pulp painting. We made some uh, provisionary looms to drape the yarn across the sheets of paper. Here I am squeezing wet paper pulp through a stencil onto the base sheet of paper. And here is the finished piece. So those threads, again, are embedded between layers of paper pulp, and um, they will be there forever. And uh, Liz did cut out some of the yarns as well to create these draping areas. It's really quite lovely. She also worked on two larger pieces. These are double the size of the other one um, and very colorful. And these were unique works, handmade cotton paper with pulp painting and embedded yarns. And I did not make a closing uh, slide, but that is the end of my presentation. So thank you all very much. Okay, Tatiana, the floor. You, the floor. Get myself unmuted. Thank you so much, Nicole. That was wonderful. And, um, very informative and a little depressing about some of the commercial paper industry, um, but maybe makes us feel a little bit better about how much we try in our own small way in hand paper making to limit a little bit um, what we what we do with paper um, and water. Okay, um, let's share my screen. Okay, um, tonight I'm going to talk about water, uh, which is our topic, as essentially as an inspiration as much as anything. 
Um, Nicole's given us a lot of facts and a lot of basis to understand the paper making process, um, which I know that uh, from looking at all the people who are with us tonight, many of you know very intimately. And I hope even if you do, that you'll learn something. Um, for me, water has always been a source of inspiration and spending time at the water, but also looking at images of water has always been important to my uh, own visual practice. So aerial shots of water, maps, um, charting the bottom of the ocean, um, and then other kinds of surfaces of water or liquids that suggest maybe larger and more complex structures and systems like for example, the surface of an indigo um, extraction or a surface of wood that resembles water or seems like water. Um, one of my favorites is coffee crema. I'm not gonna talk too much about that tonight, but I could go on at length. I've been doing a series of drawings based on coffee crema, um, but mostly I use it as an inspiration maybe for things like this, which are um, paper pulp, with water droplets in it. And um, as anyone who's made paper knows, it's almost difficult not to occasionally get a water droplet on your sheet of paper. And if you do, you get um, little patterns like this. Um, and as we pigment or add pigments to um, our fibers to color them, we tend to also create images, um, whether intentional or unintentional, that can be sources of inspiration. Um, but today, mostly I'm gonna talk about water as a tool and how we could use water um, in some specific ways. Um, I went to Japan to study natural dyes and of course to take um, dye and do anything with it, you start out with the plants and then you've got to extract them. So water quality and um, Water properties are very, very important with that. Um, so, and we dyed finished sheets of paper as well as paper pulp, like I'm dying here. Um, in the textile industry in Japan, historically, um, Yuzen dyeing, all kinds of dyed fibers, as well as um, finished textiles would be rinsed in the water in running rivers and streams. And as you can imagine, at some point that meant that um, your stream was running multiple colors. And eventually people realized that they had to pay a little more attention. When everything was natural dyes, that was a little safer than it is now. Um, but in the paper making process, there are still some places, some um, sections of Japan where they use the rivers a lot. Um, for example, this is um, in Nara Prefecture, where school children um, learn to make paper, which is very important in that region, and they make their own diplomas, which is very um, big, fun project that they do. Um, sake labels are often for the very high-end sake um, made out of paper in Japan, and Sake has a, a very uh, close relationship to paper in a lot of ways. They both need very clean water and both paper making and um, breweries tend to be located in places that naturally have clean, soft, fresh water because they need such a vast quantity of it. Um, so you can see in paper making areas still, people might be um, lightening their fibers in water, like in this case where um, a couple of rocks are holding down um, a bit of kozo and it's getting naturally whitened. In the cooking process, of course, um, rinsing and cooking paper making fiber to get it to be soft and lustrous and beautiful and usable to form a sheet of paper, the water is very important. And then in, if you've ever made Japanese paper, you know that the next part of the process is picking out all the impurities and water is your friend in this. Um, if, you, if you do this dry, it takes forever. If you do this in water, a lot of the little bits and things that you wanna discard 
naturally float away. And in some areas of Japan, they divert sections of the river or streams um, and just have a constant stream of fresh water flowing in to that, um, you know, uh, that chiritori area. This water is extremely, extremely cold. Um, it doesn't look like it because she's sort of being very positive about it, but her hands are freezing, I'm sure. Um, in the paper making process, as Nicole mentioned, a lot of the water drips back into the vat and it's conserved. So there um, isn't usually quite as much water um, that's discarded in the Japanese paper making process. So as you form sheets of paper, um, you keep kind of reusing a lot of that. Um, and in the Western paper making process, like here are, I am with our former artistic director at Dudenay, Paul Wong, we're making uh, a very large sheet of paper in a duckle box at Dudenay. And you can see that a lot of the water is going onto the floor. And uh, although we do our best to conserve water, uh, some of the nature of the way that we're working means that we are using a lot of water that's getting discarded. So um, talking about water as a tool and talking about water as an inspiration, I wanted to show a couple of images of this particular kind of process um, that we tend to do a lot of at Dudenay. Um, this is a blowout, many of you know this. We use a, a fogget nozzle, um, which has a kind of fine stream of water that it will create to blow out or remove um, parts of a sheet of freshly formed paper that aren't protected by a stencil. And this very simple idea can be used in many, many different ways. So um, in my own work recently, I've been layering sheets of paper of different colors and using that as a way, using that sort of strategy as a way of carving back down into those layers and revealing what's below. So instead of um, everything being additive, it's somewhat subtractive, almost like scratch board. Um, so this series that I've been working on, these image, these pieces are a little under 30 by 40 inches. So um, large, but uh, still sort of um, human scale manageable. Um, and this series is based on um, punch, it's called, is based on train ticket patterns. Um, so these, these patterns that kind of happen incidentally as a conductor punches um, into, uh, in this case, a 10 trip ticket for the Long Island Railroad. In specific, these were um, collected by my husband while his father was sick and he was visiting him. So they have um, kind of a sense of almost a record of that time and that care um, before his father died. But I also thought that these were really interesting as patterns and as almost characters, they have a sort of personality. So I first began by making a series of paintings um, using egg tempera in a very liquidy manner um, and using that kind of surface tension of water and then I really felt that it needed to be somehow more in, integrated into the paper. And as a paper maker, my instinct was to build up layers and carve some of these patterns back through those layers. Um, so this one, for example, is a layer of um, linen and then um, cotton and then flax. Um, Kozo, there's a whole bunch of different fibers layered on top of each other. So um, all of those fibers are prepared separately, colored separately, and then they kind of become one as they dry. And you get a little rippling or cockling in the forms as well. So just to take you through um, one, building up one image, um, here's one that began with um, a gray base sheet. On top of that, I layered pulp paint, which Nicole has already described to you. Um, then a sheet of abaca, then more pulp paint. Um, this is cotton. 
another Attica, this one with water droplets, and then finally a sheet of um, gray Attica on top. And then on top of that, I put a stencil that um, has these images in it. And then I use that same tool, that water pressure, just to carve back down and kind of selectively choose how much to reveal of each layer, which is a really fun um, and very intuitive kind of process. And then the finished piece you can see kind of has um, the colors just at the edges in some parts and then through the middles of the forms in other places. And occasionally I use the same exact stencil um, in a different piece like this one with a completely different set of colors. Often I cut, recut stencils or I alter them, but sometimes I think it's interesting to see those same images um, rendered in a different way. And then sometimes I use just um, one punch or two punches um, like these, which is actually um, two times that the conductor would have punched, but they sort of blend into one and become uh, almost like a fish or a character. It has seems to me to have a personality of its own. So again, this is, um, you know, kind of 30 by 40 ish. Um, in some of them, the color combinations are rather unpredictable. So as they dry, they look very different than when they're wet. So building up um, layers of water droplets and carving back into the layers and seeing which fibers kind of um, blow out or blow away faster. So in this one, for example, you can see those fuzzy edges from um, a bast fiber that's much longer than um, say the orange layer, which is a, a short cotton. So they kind of each have their personality and each have their way of reacting. So in that way, you have to kind of let the fiber do what the fiber wants to do. And um, going back to sort of the idea of the water, really in a lot of ways, the water is creating the image and the water and how much you remove or add is what remains. And I like about this process that essentially it's a record of that action, of that time of um, water and pulp being almost one. The pulp is so watery that it moves so easily and then um, kind of leaves trails almost like a river um, as it's flowing leaves, uh, discards some branches or leaves or weeds on the side. So you get that kind of effect. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Tatiana. May, your turn. Thank okay. you. Thanks so much, Tatiana, Nicole. What a great event. I really enjoyed your presentations. Let me share my screen. So thanks so much for having me on this talk. I'm a, again, an interdisciplinary artist based in Rhode Island whose work is very much rooted in hand paper making and place and involves turning plants and into paper. So I wanted to start by talking about how I got started on this journey with paper making and my approach to making work that is very much place-based. I grew up in Connecticut, went to graduate school for printmaking at Louisiana State, you know, two very different landscapes, Connecticut to South Louisiana. So I started by exploring different sites in the area. And I started to become drawn to these sort of dark leftover industrial sites like abandoned sugarcane factories. And this work, which is the woodcut on handmade paper uh, is a lock to the Mississippi River. So I would gather sketches multiple times at the sites. I would gather materials like river mud and uh, agro waste for paper making and put that all into the art blender and come out with the body of work, which is blatant landscape. So part of this is about 
kind of conveying the psychology of these sites I was looking at. One of the fibers I used a lot was bagasse. So that's the fiber left over from processing sugarcane. Uh, that's like a eight acres of bagasse dating from the 1800s. So it's interesting hearing Nicole talk about, you know, agricultural waste in other countries being better about using it. Now that's a fiber source down there. Um, so I use this for a sculpture called Bagasse Construction, which I'm still doing this series of sort of sculptural books, which is more about uh, a study of material of itself and how it behaves. Um, and it's also where I realize, you know, why do I choose paper making as an artist? Because it can add context and content to an artwork. So in this other construction, I mixed Mississippi River mud into linen rag pulp to make this sort of sculptural book. I also wanted to capture the sites I was researching. So this is a picture of me casting the Mississippi River levee. Uh, I think that was with linen rag pulp. Um, and bringing that paper cast back into the gallery as an actual impression of the sites. So there's like rocks and grass and such in that work. Moving on. So about 10 years ago, I moved to Rhode Island and I began by studying what local fibers were available and attainable around me. And I started working a lot with invasive plant species because one, they're plentiful. There's a lot in one space. Um, and people are really generally happy that you're removing these. Um, and if you don't know what an invasive plant is, it's a plant that is non-native to an ecoregion. Um, and it's economically or ecologically harmful to areas. So that's the agreed upon definition here. So this installation is about studying the characteristics of those invasive plant fibers. I also continued my study of looking at local rivers. This is about the Seekonk River and incorporating river mud from different sites along the river. It's a tidal river that goes out to the ocean. Um, I mean, it's these places that I'm looking at, it, it, for me, this piece especially, it was a place of sort of this disconnect, disconnect between people um, and the land, and, and you know, in this case, the waterways. No, the river mud is really gross. <laughs> um, one of the invasive plants that I started working with and I still work with is Codium fragile. And it has a growing present, presence in Narragansett Bay. So that's the bay here in Rhode Island. Um, it's actually originally from off the coast of Japan. And so I use this in this wall sculpture um, based on blind drawings of ocean surfaces. So a blind drawing is when you're looking at something and not looking at your paper where you're drawing, you're looking at the subject of study. So in this work uses no wire. It's using the characteristic of the seaweed pulp and abaca pulp and how it shrinks and hardens up as it dries to form um, a sculptural work. So here's a close up of that. Work makes work. This series is also made from Codium. It's called Oyster Thief. Um, and it sort of is talking about how the seaweed is particularly bad in this area because it one takes over native uh, eelgrass, which baby shellfish need to live. And it also attaches itself to cohogs and clams and floats away with it. So shellfish men don't really like that. I love working collaboratively. This is a series called Ebb and Flow made individually and collaboratively with another artist called Megan Singleton, who's based in St. Louis. And these have been installed across the country. They are based on each site's, the installation site's local watershed maps and use local plant fibers. So if you don't know what a watershed is, it is an area of land where water drains out down creeks into rivers and out into the ocean. So this is, this one's Ebb and Flow 5, which is the watershed I am in, the Blackstone River watershed. 
which interestingly in the 90s was the most polluted river in the country because of uh, heavy textile mills from the industrial revolution. So there's a lot of heavy metals in here in the river. Um, so it's a close up so you can sort of see that textural river mud element. And I used various invasive aquatic and shoreline plants. Corresponding with uh, ebb and flow five it are these uh, prints and pulp paintings. It's a taxonomy of all the things I was studying when making that installation. So there is river mud paper, there are pulp paintings um, and cyanotypes based on dam sketches I was doing because there are dams up all along the Blackstone River where there were historically textile mills. Um, so on the left, you can see it's uh, one of the cyanotypes. Uh, cyanotype really briefly is kind of like a blueprint or sunprint process if you're not familiar, also invented around the time of the Industrial Revolution. I, I coat the paper with light sensitive chemistry, lay down a transparency with a drawing or a plant silhouette, expose it to sun, rinse it out, and then I have a printed image. On the right is a pulp painting of one of the dam sites abstract. And then variable milfoil is a very common invasive pond weed in a lot of freshwater ponds across North America. Um, and then linen red, I thought it'd be nice to show you um, since there were a lot of textile mills in the area. This is ebb and flow too. So this was installed at Brown University. I did this with Megan and it's roughly the shape of the Narragansett Bay watershed, which encompasses all of Rhode Island and actually goes into Massachusetts and Connecticut too. Um, and for this installation, it's pretty cool. We had a really educational component where we did a taxonomy of the seven specific invasive plant species we used in the installation. We made paper from each of the plants and then Megan laser cut the a vector silhouette of each of the plants. So this is really kind of the moment where some of the work I was doing was becoming more directly educational versus abstract because these silhouettes included the common name but also the botanical name. Um, that installation was really inspired, that reddish color was inspired by my study of red seaweeds in the bay, specifically heterosophenia japonica, it's a red seaweed um, that's invasive, it blooms. There's actually many species in there. There's a picture of all the stuff washed up, uh, clumped up. And I had a problem when doing the research for that installation. How do I preserve this seaweed for proper identification later? So I started layering the seaweeds within um, very translucent linen rag pulp for presentation. And I just really loved how these looked, I was really struck by them. And so this became the macroalgae series. So, you know, I started it for purpose of identification, but now for me, it's about archiving, it's about witnessing, and it's also about elevating the physicality of our living oceans. These very small, they're like six by nine inches. Um, these very small works inspired very large works. This is Great Salt Cove macroalgae. Um, these are pulp paintings. They're about eight feet by 10 feet. They're installed at TF Green Airport here, but they were uh, initially installed outdoors in downtown Providence, Rhode Island on a parking garage facade for a couple of weeks. And it's called Great Salt Cove macroalgae because there's a subtle silhouette there that is the historical cove that was once a lot of downtown Providence, including this site. So it's sort of speaking to that, you know, development and filling in of this tidal cove um, over the centuries. Related to all of this work is another series called Rhode Island Herbarium. This is like 12 by 17 inches. And again, that's that Codium seaweed I was talking about earlier. And it's a process shot for you of embedding the seaweed within paper pulp. Now for Rhode Island herbarium, 
I started, because I had more space, gilding the place names of the collection sites where I collected the seaweeds. So upon like deeper research and deeper thinking, I realized one, like, place names change over time for sure. And they also change with different peoples. So I started gilding the colloquial name. Let's go to the next slide. Google Maps name, and then also the indigenous name. In this case, it's Narragansett named Nam Cook for a place called Rome Point. Um, you know, Namash an Algonquin fish cook, like a land fishing place. And also I, I nerd out and look a lot into about the seaweed itself, its origins and distribution methods, blah, blah, blah. Um, so there's a lot of information that goes, that I learn about as I, to create work. And so when I display in just public areas, I like to include that information in the catalog and of course on my website portfolio page. So this is a lot of that work uh, installed at Providence City Hall, installed at TF Green Airport. Now, you know, work makes work makes work. This is the weathering series using, you know, the mess ups of those seaweed papers. And I started gilding copper metal leaf onto these works. And then I oxidized the copper with a mix of Providence River water and Miracle Grow to get that different turquoise, that turquoise color, and to see what sort of tones I could get from that sort of chemical reaction between the copper, the water, whatever's in the water and the air. I love doing public artwork. This is Blackstone watershed papers. Uh, we pasted cyanotypes that are about three feet in diameter in downtown Pawtucket. It's Pawtucket, Pela. Um, <laughs> oh, Pawtucket claims to be the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, apparently, but there's a town in Western Mass that also claims it is, so who knows, in dispute. Um, but these have printed on them silhouettes of different invasive pond weeds and shoreline plants in the area. And the one on the right is something called water chestnut, which I thought would be cool to show more process photos of for you. Uh, scientific name, Trappa Natanz, has European origins. I think some dude in, for Harvard Botanical Gardens brought it over from England like in the 1800s or something. <laughs> But it's a huge problem now, and it's taking over a lot of freshwater ponds in northern Rhode Island. I think it's taking over the southern part of Lake Champlain, so there's a big effort there in trying to manage this invasive problem. The photo on the left is me kayaking. This is a 10-acre pond that is completely taken over by this pond weed. That's not a field. On the right is a different pond, central pond, where you can actually see the pond weed from satellite view. Um, and my work, you know, looking at these invasive plants, you know, tells me a story about our cultures and gives me a picture of, you know, how the, the health of our landscapes, you know, reflects our human health and community health in the area. So seeing something like this is really alarming. Processing these, this pond weed, this very scary pond weed. So on the left is how I Harvest them, I actually strap the laundry basket to the kayak, put the pond weed in, I rinse it out, I cook it, and on the right is a bunch of, um, of the water chestnut drying. I actually have to, it has really sharp seeds, sharp enough, these like nuts, sharp enough to like pop a car tire, so I have to remove those first before I cook them and stuff. This is a process shot of that public art piece, those circular wheat pasted cyanotypes using a hula hoop, mold in a kiddie pool to make the papers and like a wood floor in the studios. And then and on the right is the process shot of capturing that plant silhouette with the uh, cyanotype or sun pit print process. Um, I haven't really, this is not even on my website because it's newer work, but I use that fiber in these sculptural uh, wall works installations and I'm not sure what this means yet. I just know it was an intimidating pond weed that poked out at me. Um, and I only have like this slide, another slide, just another recent work. This is based on Rome Point and using Codium fragile, that green sort of seaweed again. 
And I was really drawn to this site and the stories tied to the place because in the seventies, it was proposed as a, nu a site for a nuclear power plant and with cooling towers that would circulate water up from the bay through the cooling towers and then back to the bay, like essentially raising the temperature and altering the entire ecology of Narragansett Bay. But through community action, um, this did not, grassroots action, this did not happen. Um, it's also a traditional fish, fishing site um, for the first peoples of Rhode Island. So I was just thinking about nuclear cooling towers and circularity and just these weird interconnections between everything and came out with these creepy wall sculptures. And then just work I did, you know, we're talking about water here, work I did this winter um, based on blind drawings of fossilized fish from the natural, uh, Harvard Natural History Museum and looking at colors of the water surfaces in Narragansett Bay and using ginkgo biloba, which is a living fossil, a species that's been around for forever. This, trying to pull these interconnections together. So thank you. My artist website is maybabcock.com. I'll stop sharing my screen. And just one more thing, we're talking about water. So Hand Paper Making Magazine has an issue completely dedicated to the theme of water too. So sure. people wanna read more about other work out there on this topic, thank you. May, there is a question in the chat. Is this the same water chestnuts that we cook with? No, different plant. Wow, fantastic. All right, time for Q&A. Uh, thank you for these amazing talks. Anybody has a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Um, uh, raise your hand as well, that would help. So, um, I can try and see, we can try and see. Yeah. Well, I have a question for May. Uh, so May, my understanding is that you try new fiber, new plants, right? Is that what you're doing? And so you don't know exactly what's gonna, I, do you, are you harnessing them? Are you instead going with the flow? Um, how does that, because you're essentially charting new territory with those plants. Is... Uh, yeah, um, I guess there's a lot of trust involved and faith in experimentation uh, to try these different plants as you know, viability for paper making fibers. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, there are there are a couple of questions, Nicole. Um, yes, I see them. Um, so the the first question looks to be uh, mentioned about adding a retention agent when adding color to pulp. Um, and when we are pigmenting pulp, we are using using either purical retention agent, which comes in a powder form, or um, the, the liquid kind that does not need to be refrigerated, um, which I don't really know if Carriage House has a label on that. Uh, so it is, it is a different kind of mordant uh, than what you would use typically for dyeing a sheet of paper or for dyeing fabric. Um, but it can be easily sourced from Carriage House, Twin Rocker, et cetera, um, paper making suppliers. Um, the other question I see here comes from Joanna Gare, and um, I'm interested to know about the longevity of the papers made from these species. Do you pH test along the way for archival recording? So May, do you want to talk a little bit about that, or <laughs> I can I can speak to that too. 
Um, is the question, oh yeah, uh, yeah, just about the, the species I work with. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I pH test um, after rinsing, after I cook the fibers. Um, and I pH test, you know, obviously when I'm cooking with caustic around to pH 11. Longevity, personally, I, that is an archivalness is not a concern of mine considering uh, the climate crisis and where we're heading. Sorry, that's a little dark, but. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I would say it, typically for, for my purposes, I am, you know, pH testing the cooking liquid and then uh, afterwards to make sure that it's been neutralized. And, and from there really sort of paying attention to the qualities that the paper has in terms of fold strength um, and, and what it's, you know, sort of general tac tactile, um, how much it can sort of stretch or, or easily bend. And um, I don't have a lab for rapid aging uh, to test that, but I know that you can probably put in it and put it in an oven <laughs> to uh, replicate some of that, uh, you know, natural aging process. Um, yeah, but that's, I have not gone that far either in my invasive plant papers uh, to test those things. But I do like using them in books and uh, I think fold strength is probably the number one important thing. And, um, you know, actually testing your water for iron or other heavy metals is perhaps more important than, you know, we can cook the fibers treat them and we know that we're more or less doing the proper archival thing for those fibers. Um, but, you know, really paying attention to your water source and what that paper looks like even after a few years, um, foxing and other things can start to show up. I think there is a question for that I think Tatiana should answer. What is the advantage of using linen in pulp painting? You're I'm muted. muted. Uh, it's a good question. Um, I used to always just, you know, use cotton or use whatever I had, but once you have used linen, you never go back um, because it holds the color so beautifully and it gives you, um, you know, as a bast fiber, it's going to hold the color better than cotton, but also, um, linen gives you, uh, especially when it's very long beaten, it gives you this sort of wonderful um, plastic material that can kind of really do anything that you might do with paint. It's very easy to manipulate it. It has a kind of gelatinous quality um, and it's, it's very silky. So it's nice to work with. Um, and uh, it also, if you have used Attica or something else um, as, a, as a pulp painting medium, what's nice about linen is it has a little bit of um, opacity. Even when it gets very translucent, it has a slight whiteness to it. So if you start out with white linen, it makes your colors brighter and you can get a lot of very um, brilliant, intense colors when you work with linen, so. Wonderful, thank you. And May, there are questions about, but actually I think all of you, also Nicole, uh, the durability of handmade paper when you do outdoor installations. Um, you're probably talking about those big pulp paintings that were out there for a few weeks. I chose really strong fibers. So it's a mix of flax and kozo, um, maybe a little bit of avoca. I'm not a scientific paper maker. Um, lots of internal sizing and surface sizing. And I actually coated those uh, with natural floor coating. They still look good. They didn't really yellow. It's like uh, Vermont natural coating, which is made from a cheese byproduct from Vermont. So that worked out really well and they still look good. So uh, they held up really well out, outdoors. 
So. And again, for me, um, has your work uh, sparked a conversation about climate concerns in your town where you live? Yeah, I think so. Um, I've worked on and off, uh, depending if I have grant money at a community garden um, run by an organization called Southside Community Land Trust that Galgo project housing and making paper from like garden weeds. And then like the big invasive plant there is Japanese knotweed, which we're in like year five of trying to remove this awful plant. So people can grow their vegetables. Um, so, you know, through, you, you know, walk up, make and take, paper making and after school workshops with families, you know, conversations about that sort of arises, you know, just because we are working with an invasive plant. Um, yeah, hope that answers that question. Nicole, do you have anything to add about the outdoor? Yes, um, you know, I've, I've been working outdoors with handmade paper since 2009. Um, and, you know, it really started off as a process of wanting to see that, um, that kind of entropy over time, making these outdoor installations and having the paper sort of very gradually um, working with a high shrinkage paper that would be very sculptural to start, but each time it's resaturated by um, rain, it loosens and relaxes and then dries in a new position. So I was really, I was really interested in having that kind of a, an effect. Um, and the papers, you know, the paper fibers that I'm using, like May is using, are very strong. So I'm using flax fiber and I'm using abaca. Um, both of those have tremendous wet strength and flax has a very long um, cellulose molecule chain. I mean, it's just, yeah, much, much longer than cotton is. Um, so it really holds up and it doesn't tear. And uh, the sculpture that I showed you in South Philadelphia, which was installed for six weeks, I want to say, was knocked over by three nor'easters in that time because it was um, installed in October and in the middle of a big open lawn with absolutely nothing to stop it. I only had one sheet of paper and those sheets of paper were four foot by five foot, giant sails. One of them had a hole in it after six weeks. And the rest of the paper was used to make a dress that I wore <laughs> and it was reused. Um, so they're very tough papers. They will last a long time. Next question, do any of you capture leftover water uh, and then filter it before returning it to soil, plants, et cetera? Yeah. May, do you want to comment? Yeah, I just try to reuse, uh, reuse the water as much as I can. Like a lot of the works, I use a decal box. So it's like the same amount of water that's like five gallon bucket that's run through several times. Um, you know, and then it gets like a little gunky. So I either like uh, throw it in my compost pile if it's too my compost pile isn't wet enough, you know, because it needs to be wet enough to compost down or throw it in my plants. My, and then like the caustic uh, that's left over like the cooking liquid, I either just like evaporate it out slowly over time, <laughs> undercover and under the pop-up tent and bath right now, I do have some that you can neutralize with acid. Um, and you can like water down and water plants, you know, cause it's basically like a salt, I guess, if you're using soda ash and it's found in nature and some plants even like, you know, slightly alkaline soils. Like I have to add lime to my garden in any ways because mm -hmm. of the acidity of our soils anyway. So uh, that gets a little gardeny, but. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's a really good point. And, um, you know, I certainly 
reuse water as much as possible in my studio. So um, in my studio at PAFA, we have floor drains, which is lovely because then you don't need to be quite so mindful, but my personal studio does not have floor drains. And so I need to be very conservative with how I'm using water because I vacuum everything up um, or it has to be directed into some location. So I try to use that, the original water as many times as possible for each of the steps and whether it becomes a rinse bucket or it just becomes a place to rinse off tools in between sheet forming and other things. Um, I'm using a lot of the water that way and I always remove the solids before disposing of the water and as May said, uh, neutralize the alkali with, it, with vinegar essentially um, before disposing of that water. Um, and I do know people who use it very successfully in their garden. <laughs> Wonderful. And is <clears throat> cyanotype toxic? It's like iron salts, technically. So it's one of the lesser, not, not toxic compared to other historical photographic processes out there, from my understanding. Lindsay's here, she can answer that better than I can. She taught me cyanotype. <laughs> Calling her out. <laughs> okay, I think here is another question. How do you handle, May, how do you handle mud in your paper artwork? Do, how do you make them adhere to the pulp so it will not become powdery when dried? Oh, I mean, when the papers are dry, you know, it feels a little silty, but remarkably, the fibers are really good at capturing the river mud and sediment within the paper. It's kind of like, you know, I know some people add like a kale and clay sometimes to like cotton pulse for casting and stuff. I think it's the same, same idea. I mean, especially if it's more of a clayey mud versus like a sandy mud because clay um, suspends itself more within water than sand. I mean, you think of like a beach, like water runs out right away versus muds, water really wants to stay with that sediment, from my, my understanding. Um, so yeah, I was surprised when, how well it holds the river mud. I mean, I've done sandy river mud too. It seems to be pretty good. And I use, you know, linen rag, which is really strong as Nicole was talking about long cellulose fibers. That helps, I think, versus using cotton might not work as successfully. As yeah, I think there's a lot them. of tradition of that too, um, of using different colored muds in paper making. In Japan, they use it a lot for um, backing scrolls and screens because it's very dimensionally stable paper, um, it doesn't expand and contract as much. So I think as long as um, you don't use so much mud that it overwhelms your cellulose fiber, then, um, you know, it makes it hard to form the sheet, then I think, I think it's a, a wonderful addition. That's really cool. Thanks. Tatiana, uh, there is a question for you. Um, do you have a native U.S. bamboo species species that can that you can suggest for paper making? Hmm. Um, I don't think uh, you guys might have a better answer to this than I do. I don't have a, a suggestion on that. Bamboo is a little bit difficult to process for paper making in some ways, um, but um, there are. Uh, definite resources for that. There are several books on paper making for, with plants, as well as um, the back of Timothy Barrett's book on Japanese paper making has a wonderful index written by Winifred Lutz, who was on this call. Um, and so I think uh, there's some good resources for that kind of thing. Um, and people have pretty much any plant you can think of, people have tried to make paper out of it. Um, you know, and they've come up with some plants that we all use that we've talked about tonight that are maybe the easiest or yield the most um, 
consistent results. And that said, that doesn't mean that those other things wouldn't work, just like May is experimenting a lot with um, you know, invasive species and things that she doesn't know yet what they will do. Um, almost, almost most plant materials will make paper. It's just how difficult will it be and how worth it will it be in the end. Yeah, Nicole suggested Lillian Bell's books. Those are excellent. Uh, there's like a river cane that's endemic to southeastern United States. I was actually researching different bamboos for my own house and yard. And that came up as actually whatever native to the area. So you could look at that. I sent you the scientific name in the chat. And I believe um, actually maybe Elaine Koretsky wrote pretty extensively about, or at least explored the bamboo papers um, that are made in Southeast Asia and described a six year redding process to extract the fiber from the bamboo. So if, you're, if you have patience, if you have real paper making patience, you can do it. <laughs> Six years, wow. Um, last question, uh, Nicole, what was the fiber used in the Mango Mango edition? That was all cotton. <laughs> that was all cotton, um, you know, very intensely pigmented cotton and um, cotton really is for a project like that, where we were, um, that dog is about six or seven inches deep. So it's very dimensional. Um, in order to have paper really hold that form and keep it true, uh, cotton was sort of the best fiber to do that. Fabulous. I think, I don't see any more questions. Um, and so we can call it a night. Thank you so much, Tatiana, Nicole May. It was really, really remarkable. We learned a lot. And now we all want to do paper making for those of us who don't yeah. yet. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. And um, we will see you at another talk soon. Have a wonderful night. Bye-bye. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Mira. <laughs>